Anyone else up there? Blessings, 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 blessings to all of you, my friends, to my Facebook family, to all of our musical family across the length and breadth of this country. It's that time again, Spotlight on Music, sponsored by the Fellowship of Music and Arts. And my friends, do we have a very special guest for you tonight. What I want you to do is begin to like and share, tag your friends, let everybody know that we are on live. And our guest tonight, listen, you know him, you've heard of him, you've witnessed him, you've shared his ministry, and what a blessing he is to the body of Christ worldwide. And listen, uh, uh, before I let the cat out the bag, I need all of you, you can join us in the, in the comment section if you have greetings, or if you have some questions for our guests, you are welcome to do that. We're on all our outlets. We're, we're on the Bishop Andre S. Woods page, Andre Sonny Woods page. We're on Fellowship of Music and Arts. We're all over Facebook tonight. So I pray that you are prepared uh, for this wonderful time of conversation as we share tonight with the man of God, um, a minstrel anointed man of God uh, for some 30, 40 years. I can remember this man's ministry, and most important of all, that he is a child of God, saved, sanctified, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Listen, you help me welcome, all of you help me welcome my friend, my brother, 
uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, Maestro Mance H. Hand. Blessings, my brother, and welcome. Thank you, Bishop. What an honor and privilege it is to be here with you on tonight. Uh, it's just, uh, it's amazing to be able to have this conversation with such an icon as yourself. I, I feel so blessed and privileged tonight. Man, you 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 made my my year already, Doc. Listen, <laughs> I tell people all the time, you know, me and Rudy, we talk about it all the time, man. Uh, the years, years and years and years go back when we would watch Bountiful Blessings on TV, man. And, uh, you know, most of us here in Detroit, you know, I, I knew about some of those other organs, you know, those. Uh, well up the organs and uh but man when i saw you playing that white cabinet organ <laughs> i said i told my grandfather i want one <laughs> yeah 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 but man yeah. listen I, uh we ain't gonna prolong the time but listen friends you'll be able to join us uh greet greet our brother in the comment section if you don't mind if you have questions we'll entertain questions a, a little bit up the road but listen man i want you uh if you will take us back to the beginning of your musical journey, how you started in music, and then ultimately uh, how it took you to, to land that position with the late Bishop Gilbert Earl Patterson. Just take your time and say it like you want. <laughs> well, thank you again, Bishop. Well, you know, I um, started in music at the age of six. Uh, my mother uh, had me taking piano lessons my mother, uh, who passed away in 09, was a concert pianist. And my dad was a, a musician as well. And so the music kind of ran in my family. My, my, my two aunts, one played the organ and one sang for the late Dr. W. Herbert Brewster. And the first time I directed a choir outside of my church, which was Ebenezer Baptist Church in Memphis, um, was for Dr. Brewster. Dr. Brewster was an icon, wrote so many great songs. Uh, camp meeting at night, and he was also famous for writing music for the uh, late sister uh, Lucy E. Campbell. And um, I started then uh, directing the choir. And um, as I grew, went to high school, ended up you know playing for the Glee Club in high school, and would start hearing the Bountiful Blessings broadcast, which came on every Sunday night live at nine o'clock. And I was probably about mm, maybe 14, 15 when I was listening to that broadcast. And I would say, you know what, wow, I would just love to be a part of the church, just be a part of the church. And of course, um, my mother had me committed where I was, you know, because back then your parents, they didn't just send you to church, they took you to church. And I'd sit there on the piano with my mother as she played for the services and everything like that. So fast forward, um, I, the barbershop that I went to, Bishop Patterson also went to the same barbershop. And I would ride my bike up to the barbershop just to see him. He was like, he was just like a superstar to me, right? So um, he knew my dad. And I told him, I said, man, when I become 18, I'm gonna join your church. He said, oh, no, nah, you're not gonna do it. So on my 18th birthday, which was in August, I joined uh, Balance of Blessings. And for two years, and this is a message already to, to musicians, for two years, I made no money. I was glad to be there. I was glad to be a part of the service, glad to be a part of the ministry. Of course, I was still in school. And I did not know that he was actually just watching me, watching to see how loyal and how faithful I was just to the church for two years. So after two years passed by, and I mean, I was loyal. I was doing Sunday morning service, Sunday night, Tuesday night, and I would show up for rehearsal. So two years later, he called me down in the office. He said, listen, I've just been watching you, and I'm going to put you on staff. And I became a member of the staff at that at that time. And I was just so excited to be there, man. Uh, fast forward, the years went by and I was over the youth choir, I played for the youth choir for a number of years. Um, never had a community choir, never had a singing group because uh, to Bishop Patterson, faithfulness and loyalty was everything, right? So I was just committed to that work. And um, we were preparing for a special day and the gentleman who was the minister of music fell ill and bishop looked at me and said well he's apostle patterson then he said listen i got rance allen coming i have the o'neill twins coming and um cassetta george is coming 
and there was a there was another artist that was coming. He said, "Get my choir together." I had two weeks to do it, so man, I had a couple of rehearsals, and when we had the service, after the service was over, he said, "Listen, uh, thank God for the missionaries, thank God for the elders, thank God for everyone who participated in this service. It was phenomenal. The choir was wrapped around the back of the choir stand, and the church was so packed there was chairs all down the aisle." And his last comment was, he said, listen, this choir was absolutely phenomenal. I want to thank God for this choir. He said, and let's just thank God for our minister music, Brother Mans HN. And I grabbed my chest. I said, what did he just say? And so when I went downstairs at the service, I said, Apostle, what happened? He said, man, listen, um, if you can get a choir together that fast, I think you deserve to be my minister music. And I became minister music that day. And I was the minister of music from that day until he went home to be with the Lord in 07, which was 30 years, right? And man, over over course of time, span of time, I traveled the nation and the world with him all over everywhere, just, you know, accompanying him, uh, big conferences, Benny Hinn conference, uh, Oral Roberts conferences, everywhere. And uh, a short story about the organ, that was an acrylic white hammer. They were custom made. And uh, I saw the organ at the music store and went and told him, I said, Bishop, I want to get one of these organs. And he was, he was just that kind of guy. Whatever you need it, you go get it. He said, well, you know, if that's what you need, go get it. So, man, I went to the music store, got the organ, and we had two because we had a church in our White Haven location and then we had the church downtown. So we had the white organ in both locations. And people were just baffled because they had never seen a white Hammond like that before. And uh, that organ just, it became a part of the history of, of the music ministry there at Bountiful. And uh, for at least 25 years, um, every day I was in his presence. And being in his presence taught me a lot because of course, you know, when you grow up, my mother was a single parent. And when you grow up and you, and you have that male image in front of you, you learn a lot about just life. You learn a lot about loyalty. And I also learned a lot about just being a man. Uh, even though I was the minister of music for the largest African-American church in Memphis, I still kept employment. I kept a job because I realized even at that age that it was important to have health care, benefits, and up the road a future, okay? Because the reality is, when I looked outside on the sign, my name wasn't on it. I wasn't the pastor of the church. I was a part of the ministry. I was a helper at the church. So as a man, and I was married at the time, you know, uh, before my wife passed away, you need to be able to take care of your family. You need more than just, uh, who are you when you get off the organ? Who are you when you get off the piano? What can you accomplish other than saying, man, I got all the chords, I got all the runs. What happens if you break your hand? What happens if you, what happens if you can't play anymore? You need another source to sustain yourself even in ministry, no matter how large it is, because things change. So how are we looking today? So sad, broke my heart, 07, Bishop Patterson went home to be with the Lord. And of course, at that point, everything changed because, you know, and, and, and it's, it's okay because every, ministry, every administration brings on people that they feel that they want to be a part of their cabinet, and that's fine. So I'm just grateful to God that I had things in place to sustain me. Uh, even after he went home to be with the Lord. After that, I served Bishop, I mean, I served the, the Reverend Dr. James L. Nettles at the Mount Vernon Church for 10 years. Uh, Reverend Nettles was a staple in Memphis. Uh, he was the first uh, African-American city councilman, and he had one of the largest uh, African-American Baptist churches in the city. So after 10 years, he decided to retire then uh, Right after that, he went home to be with the Lord. I think it was 92 or 93 once he, when he passed away. And then uh, sometimes you think, well, you know, maybe I've had my run, you know, in this music world. And uh, God just turned the tables again. And I had a conversation with a gentleman by the name of, of Dr. Keith Norman, who uh, pastors the largest attended African-American church in the city of Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, we sat down and we talked about ministry. We sat down, we talked about life. We talked about commitment. We talked about being loyal. And here again, Bishop Woods, not knowing that over the years he had been watching. 
Because, you know, of course, you know, when these musicians, they see big churches, the first thing they think, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to get money. I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get it like that. But when you, have a, when you have a pastor and a leader that's looking for someone that's looking for ministry, that's looking for stability, that's looking for loyalty, you can't beat that anywhere. So as we discussed ministry, and he was telling me that, man, I've been watching you. I watched you serve Bishop Patterson for all those years. I watched how you serve Dr. Nettles. And I would like for you to come and do ministry with me. Can you do that? And here's the other piece to it. He said, can you come on board? Because there was a gentleman there who was already the minister of music. Very extremely talented young man. And he said, can you come to ministry and do ministry without a title? I said, listen, it's not about a title. It's about the ministry. It's about uh, the loyalty. It's about serving God and serving God's people. And, you know, if, if you can't serve God's people without a title, a parking space, or an office, there's something wrong with you and your gift. So the, the, the song that, that we sing in church that says, serve the Lord, will pay off after a while. And uh, at this point in my life, uh, Bishop Woods, serve the Lord has most definitely paid off. Uh, I'm grounded. I'm, I'm very much sound in what I do. I love my career. And you have got to love the church where you serve. You've got to be, because that's where you're being fed every week. So God bless me again to land somewhere where the word of God is being magnified, God is being exalted, um, the professionalism, the corporate structure in the ministry, everything is just A1, absolutely fantastic. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. And so now um, we're preparing, and it's a surprise to me, you may have seen it on my page, uh, the city of Memphis, some musicians and choirs and Dr. Norman, they're getting ready to celebrate my 60th birthday in two weeks and uh, 45 years in music. And I'm ex I'm ex <laughs> I'm just excited about it. Um, you know, here again, serve the Lord does pay off. And uh, it's, it's really not so much about just, you know, coming out and having a lot of people celebrate you. But it's all it's, it's about being able to be 60 years old and doing this thing for 45 years and still have a heart for it, still have a heart for God's people, still have a heart and loyalty for what you actually do. Because, see, now it's not about me anymore, Bishop. It's about the next generation that's coming behind me, that I can be some kind of beacon of light to show them, as you have done for many, many years, to show them what it takes to be a sound musician, to show them what it takes to, you know, be that kind of uh, uh, musician that's in ministry, that's just not in it for what you get. But, and here's another thing, because I say this all the time, and a lot of people don't understand this. I ask this question, why is the choir stand or the choir loft why is it located where it's located? And a lot of people don't know the answer to that. So, so why, is, why, do, why does the choir not sit in the audience? Why does the choir not sit in the balcony? Why do they not just come and sit singing from the floor? Why do they sit where they sit? Well, because the choir stand is the place of preparation. The choir prepares the people for the word of God. So that's why it is strategically placed where it is. And you can't take it for granted. You can't play with it. When you hit that podium, when you hit the pulpit, when you hit that choir law, it has to be about the people of God because people are coming, they're suffering, they're hurting, some of them are happy, some of them are sad, and you've got to choose the right kind of music for the kind of ministry that you serve. So um, there's just so many things, uh, and of course during the pandemic, everything changed. We, we kind of lost the choir um, during the pandemic, and a lot of ministries now have gone to uh, praise and worship, praise team, and I think that's phenomenal. That is great, but I, I, you know, the generation I'm in, Bishop, I miss choirs. I miss it. Yes, I miss yes. that. I miss the choir life. I really do. I really miss it. You know, and uh, because people love singing, and when people love what they do, um, it, it just makes it makes things so so much better. You know, as you serve God. So I, I'm really looking forward to when this pandemic eases up a lot, lot more so that people can be more involved um, in music ministry, right? So um, over the years, I've watched you. I watched you play for um, Reverend Nix. I watched you at St. James. I watched how you, I watched how you carried yourself. I watched how you dressed, uh, the image that you portrayed, you know, all those years. And I watched your chord structure and how you played and how you supported the worship. 
And man, listen, those things have helped me throughout my career. Between you, Rudolph Stanfield, Twinkie Clark, I mean, people that just know how to set the atmosphere for worship as they sit there on that uh, on the instrument, whether it's the piano or the organ. But man, let me tell you something: the way you play an organ, it, it's 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 life changing. And I, I know you heard this a, a lot of years, but I'm telling you, Bishop. You know, there's a sound that's in Detroit that's not everywhere. <laughs> and there's a Detroit sound. And I have tried to duplicate that sound, man, and uh, I love it. I love it. Because now the generation of musicians, now they don't like you to play with your foot. And I've just been playing with my foot all my life, right? So they like the bass, the bass uh, guitar to play the bass line, and you just don't play with your foot. So what I do, this is how I cheat. I turn the volume off on the foot. But I still play with my foot because I'm just so used to playing with it. I can't stop, right? So I, I I get excited once the music is over and I can pull that draw bar out and play something and play with my foot. Well, you know, man, that's a that's an awesome journey, man. And 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 hearing you talk, you know, uh, as before we went live, I was telling you, man. I mean, I would I would on my way to church, except when I had to go to early service. Man, I would I would be tuning in to Bountiful Blessings, man. And then they had those rebroadcasts sometime. And listen, Doc, y'all, y'all would church so until matter of fact, I a lot of us, I, I'm for one, thank God that uh, uh that that lady Gilbert, uh Madam Louise Gilbert, she still allows yes. a lot of those broadcasts to be out and and yes. you two got got a got so many of them, man. We we just go back and, and reminisce, Doc, for, yes. for just good church, you know? Yeah, good, good solid church. And, you know, Bishop, um, we have, we've gotten away from so much, uh, so many things that we did traditionally uh, years ago in music, for instance, the hymns. And I tell people all the time because people ask me, man, how you know so many hymns? Bishop Patterson was not only a phenomenal preacher, but the brother could sing. He was a yeah. great singer. And he would sing a hymn, but he wouldn't sing the chorus. He would yeah. sing two verses that you never heard before yeah. and then sing the chorus, right? And so I'm sitting there saying, what is this? And then he say, uh, amazing grace. But I didn't, but he started, yeah. uh, you know, at the verse. So that's how I learned so many hymns because he sang those hymns and I had to learn those hymns. And um, he would look at me because after about, two bars you need to have it because what a lot of people didn't even know didn't understand and know that bishop g passon also played the organ all right yeah yeah okay and he's from detroit so he right. he played he yeah he played the organ man so you know you couldn't you couldn't pull any wool over him. he he had that <laughs> ear he could hear and most of the times what the people didn't see in the in the in the in the audience or on the television he would look at me and call his key give me f or give me a flat or give me B flat. And he called his key. And I'm telling you, it will always be right. Yeah, yeah. It will always be right. And uh, as we travel, uh, before we go into the service, and we would pray before we go into the service. And he said, yeah. listen, uh, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to sing this song. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do ABC. And um, I never saw him walk out into a service with a manuscript. He would always just write down about three or four words on a piece of paper and take his Bible and preach an entire sermon in about, he never preached a long time. So in about 12 minutes, people would literally be running into each other. <laughs> yes, sir. Off of about four or five words that he wrote down on a piece of paper, right? And I said, and sometimes I would ask him, well, Bishop, what you preaching tonight? And we'd be, we'd be in an audience with five, 6,000 people and walk in and say, Bishop, what you gonna preach tonight? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and so <laughs> I don't know and he would sit down I would see him take a piece of paper about this and I'm in Nashville right now so this is my key um, with FedEx as you see in the background he would take a piece of paper uh -huh. and write down about four maybe four lines and come out stand up and preach and, and, and quote those scriptures man because people say that they thought that he helped write the Old Testament he could he, 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 he had it. I mean, he had it. He had it, man. 
and people will be just running into each other. We bump and dance and shout and just have good hot church. And a lot of times, some of, some of the atmosphere that he would give up, most preachers would die to have. Man, I, I remember one service, he preached so and the saints were shouting and dancing so hard and he walked out and went to his office. So I came out and went to the office. I said, Bishop, they, they still bumping. I mean, man, you got 3,000 people out there shouting. And you sit in your office and he was holding his head. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm disappointed. I said, why are you disappointed? He said, because that message wasn't designed for shouting. <laughs> it was designed just so they could hear God and learn something. And I didn't mean for it to go that way. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, do you know how many people would love to have a kind of atmosphere where you got that many people shouting? So he was more, not so more, not so much into the emotional part yeah. of the message, but he wanted you to actually get it. You know, I mean, get it, get it. Now, I mean, he could dance. I mean, I've never seen anybody dance like G. Patterson. He could yeah. dance, shout and praise God. But at the end of the day, he wanted you to get the message. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you what God would do when you pray. I've asked God to let me have that experience again. Yeah. Just let me have that experience again. So when I became a part of First Baptist Broad with Dr. Keith Norman, one thing you have to realize about Dr. Keith Norman, a lot of people don't know, he's a corporate, he's a corporate brother. He is the vice president at one of our largest hospitals. Uh, he's connected in the, the political community. He's connected in the religious community. But he's smart to the point that he studies the word. Yeah, he does. He doesn't. He doesn't give you a text and read two scriptures and start. Oh, that doesn't happen. He delivers God's word with clarity and with understanding and with power. And I sit there sometimes on Sunday just at at all, saying I'm reliving these bountiful days all over again. Mm -hmm. And when when a, when a man of God can stand at the sacred desk and deliver God's word to the point that people are rejoicing and happy and crying. And he's not hooping, he's not hollering, but he's giving structured word to the people of God. So here again, to all the musicians, you've got to be more than just a musician. You've got to be a worshiper. Uh, the, 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 you've got to be connected to the man of God. You've got to feel him. You've got to follow him. You've got to see what he's doing. You've really got to have his heart. You got to have his heart. So that means that you can't do everything you want to do. You can't go everywhere you want to go. And especially on Saturday night, you can't hang out. I know a lot of musicians, they play in clubs, you know, to, to, to um, help their income. But there's something about having a fresh heart and a fresh spirit on Sunday. Yeah, that when, you, when you deliver your ministry in music, the people will receive it. So you, you can't really, you can't really feel that thing. And you've been hanging out all night, you know, and mm -hmm. having your cocktails and doing what you do and then run in church on Sunday morning and think God's going to give you all of his blessings and his grace. It just doesn't happen like this. Now, sometimes, you know, we get bewildered because these musicians, male and female, they are awesome musicians. I mean, it, now it's 50 talented. 16, talented. They are, they can play, they got to record, they know every song. But what is in your heart? Yeah, man. Once you finish doing, once you finish expressing your gift and that thing that God has given you, what is in your heart as far as ministry? Does the word pierce you? Do you have, do you have a, a, a source of religion and spirit within you that the people that you serve feel God and see God, not just in the motion that you do, but in the lifestyle that you live? Yeah. yeah. That's so very important. We, I mean, we can all sing, we can all play, but what happens when you have people in your in the music ministry in your choir that are troubled, that that uh, that are in trouble, they have financial problems, they have health problems. Everybody can't always get to the pastor just like that. That's why you are called a minister. That's why you are a minister yeah. in music because you are a minister to minister. I'm not saying you're a pastor. Don't get it wrong. Don't ever try to start a church within the church. That's one of the worst things you can do is Pat be the pastor of the choir. That's not what you are. You are a minister of music, which means that if the people that are under you, that serve under you, have problems, you should be able to go to God in prayer. Yes, sir. And pray for them. And pray them through. Yeah. That's, real, that's real ministry. 
So I can I can respect your gift. I can respect every chord you play, every run you know, every song you know. I can respect that when you have a heart for God and you have a heart for God's people. That makes your gift even better. You know, this 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 generation man has uh substituted the, the talent over the anointing and they spend more time in service congratulating themselves you know about we just did that lick man Ooh, yeah. they be on yeah. they got the headphones and the microphone and i know they be calling out the one the two three four the five whatever they calling out yeah i i do miss i do miss as as a church organist the 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 part where the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes and on the spot you're able to create. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, they're playing in such predictable patterns now. Mm -hmm. And and everybody's got, I, I listen to it, man. Everybody got got the same ride and high and licks uh that that sounds so expected and predictable. Uh as a musician, I I already know where y'all getting ready to go. Mm -hmm. You know, because I done heard it over time and time and time again with this group, that group, that group, and with the bass player, the lead guitar. Uh, uh, it's good. All of that's good. But uh, uh, as, a, as an organist, man, you know how we grew up? You know, I grew up in that church, man. My grandfather, man, I, uh, the organ was the principal. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Give me that organ and a drum. We had a pianist, you know, but but if pianist wasn't there, I want I need that organ humming. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, you know, I, I don't I don't I don't remember ever playing nothing the same way, especially when it comes to celebration time and worship. You know, unlike now, yes, so you know, they got they got everything downloaded. They got the claps downloaded. They got the licks downloaded on the computer and they they hit the start button and then there they go you know and uh some of the chords are already uh pre-programmed and mm -hmm. and uh, i'm like i don't like all that pre-programmed stuff when it comes to that kind of worship it becomes at a, at some point it 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 becomes stale you mm -hmm. know and and i'm like hey you know i, I heard that last sunday the identical same way, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm like, you know, that that ain't how we grew up. That's all I'm saying, you know. And I know oh, yeah. change, and and uh, we got technology and all that. But the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost ain't changed, man. The Holy Ghost is still looking for opportunity, and not saying that they cannot invite and be uh, anointed and do some things. But you know, it's give and take there with me. It is, and you know, Bishop, I served for 25 years as um, administrative assistant and special assistant to Dr. Madden Moss Clark when she was president of the National Music Department. All of the late night musicals and concerts, um, I put all those together in Memphis. Yeah. And when she would come to Memphis early, a few times Twinkie had a late flight or came in later. And she would, I would pick her up from the airport and she would tell me on the way to rehearsal, you got the cover tonight. Uh -huh. That was one of the most uneasy moments of my life because Dr. Clark was a perfectionist when it came to those rehearsals. And you had to hit all the chords right. You had to play that thing right or you were going to get reprimanded right there on the spot. <laughs> and what that did, you know, it, it, it made me respect my craft even more. Now, I've only had one embarrassing moment uh, in playing one night uh, at a concert. And I was, you know, I was up and coming at that point. Um, I was playing for James Moore. Yeah. And James was singing. And I was over courting him. My, I was, instead of being under him, I was over him. I was, I was over, you know, you know, I'm, I'm trying to show my chords. I'm just, I'm playing chords. James turned to me with the mic and said, you're doing too much. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> it 
in front of a whole crowd of people. And he came over to the organ. Uh-huh. And played and sang. Oh, James was a great musician as well. Oh yeah, man. James played from that night until I sit here now. I learned you support your singer. Right. After the introduction, it's not about you anymore. And you play under your singer instead of playing over your singer. And so, like as to your point that you were saying, a lot, a lot, a lot of times now, what's happening with this pre-programmed music? Um, once the Holy Spirit comes in and comes in heaven, if the music is already pre-planned, well, once the track stops, what do you do? Yes, sir. What do you do? You can't, you don't just say, okay, Holy Ghost, we're going to the next song because, you know, we got to keep going. You have to, back to my point, you got to have a certain part of you that is spiritually uh, inclined to know how to keep it going and take it to the next level. Right, so what right. you're doing in music, you're making preaching easy. I used to tell Bishop Pastor, everybody knows he was one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. I would yeah. tell him sometime before service, Bishop, I hope you got a good message because now the choir going to drink it today. So if you ain't got no sermon, the choir going to get it. And he would say, well, man, I'm not worried about the choir. So, you know, we come in church, man, the choir sings, I mean, sing, sing, they shout, sing, Bishop would get up, clap with us, shout, sing, sing, and he'd get up and say, I love him mm-hmm. because he first loved me. Yes, and he would sing man. them all the way back down. Instead of riding that way that's already high and the same, he would just say, he born my salvation way back on Calvary. Come on, lift your hands and say yes. And he would calm them all the way back down and then preach them all the way back up again. Yeah. So my point is, music is essential to worship. Because as I said before, it's the preparation period for the word. And there's got to be a spiritual, and Bishop, I'm saying this from my heart, there's got to be a spiritual connection between the minister and the musician. Yes. There has to be a spiritual connection. The musician has got to be spiritually connected to the minister so that he can feel what the minister is doing so that the music can deliver it and support it. They, they don't get, some of them don't get it, Doc. <laughs> they, 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 they're too busy trying to show their new chords and, uh, do their new flow, you know, the, mm-hmm. and 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 it amazes me uh, how non-spiritual some preachers are when it comes to music. You know, they they some of them really don't know. Most of the traditional preachers just don't know. You know, there's a couple of my buddies mad at me now. I said, man, you know, y'all, you can preach, man. You got it. Now all you need to go on down and do is just get saved and feel the Holy Ghost, and you had a whole package. Mm-hmm. But you got the letter, Doc. You you can yeah. say it. I mean, you you can write a sermon in your sleep, Doc. It ain't it ain't that, you know. It's just that I think you're scared to go all the way, you know. Right. I, I've been in services, man, uh and the preacher uh preached so and the Holy Ghost come in, or the choir would sing so, and man, they'd be totally lost. Mm. You know? And and vice versa. I've been in places where uh, the choir or the music or the pastor would preach so the Lord come in and the musicians be lost. They mm-hmm. don't know what song to, to play. They don't they don't know how to like you said the flow having that spiritual connection. But my next thing is how can you ever connect with a preacher when you plan for five and six churches in a one in one month? You at a different place every Sunday, every you know one one service, the early service somewhere else. Then you're running in here and running in there. Every right. Sunday you at a different spot. You know, I'm like, you you can't grow or you can't build right. in any place. And then they won't top dollar. That that's what get me. Yeah. You well, know? you can't you can't you can't do it because you can't. It's almost like trying to have more than one wife. You can't do it because you're gonna be cheating on somebody. And then the other part of that is you're eating at too many different tables. That is. 
you're eating at too many different tables. That's why I said on the inset of this, that especially as men, we can't be afraid to go and get a job mm -hmm. that's going to sustain us. That's going to, because most of your churches now, what mine does, you know, provide a healthcare plan and benefits for, you know, the staff. But your, your average African-American church does not provide those kind of benefits. So no. you need to have a, some kind of uh, resources where you have health care, you have a retirement, you have a 401, and you can sustain yourself to the point that when Sunday comes, you're not confused about what church am I playing for today or, you know, I got to go play for this service tonight. And all you're doing is running through one service, you know, just doing that'll do so you get to the next service. And guess what? Now you're not even considering them considering them as services. They are gigs. Yes, sir. They are gigs. And so since you're considering it as a gig, the spirit that should dwell in your heart for ministry is not there. Mm -mm. It's not there because you, you left one service and heard one thing to another service, heard half of another thing, and then you're going somewhere else and hear a piece of this. And when it all pieces together, it's confusion. Yes, sir. It's confusion. So you're eating spaghetti over here, you're eating breakfast over here, and you're eating Fourth of July food over here, and you're mixing it all together. Yeah. And it's going to make you sick. <laughs> Man. Because you're eating, at, you're eating at too many tables at the same time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen, man, we 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 could doctrinize and do all that all day with these guys. I, I pray for them, man. And I stopped fussing at them. I said, you know what, well, we got to stop and then start teaching and training for those that want it and willing to accept it. The churches uh, uh, in the last 20 years or so uh, have hurt, have been in such a need and they were hurting. So they start hiring anybody, anybody that could play in a couple of keys just so they can have some kind of music. And, and that's what they end up. Man, I can't tell you all the calls I get from pastors across the city and around the country, some of them. Can you find me a musician? Anybody willing to relocate from Detroit? I mean, I need somebody. I need, you know, no, because I right, I'm not recommending none of these cats, man. That I mean, I don't, I don't know where they where their heart is. You know, and so uh, when I look at the landscape of music, I know for us here in Detroit, it's been a lot of changes. A lot of, a lot of stuff is missing, man. The sincerity, the sound, and I was telling Rudy and Gregory and all our crew, you know, mm -hmm. listen, man, we we we've got to do something to preserve the sound, and then of course we lost. Uh, in recent last two or three years, so many of those guys that, that like Dorgan Needham, Ray Daniels, and yeah, uh, uh, Kenneth Minor, and and I mean they just they just been leaving us. God calling them home, and and so you know when I think about that, man, I'm like, okay, now we got to continue the legacy, but I got to go back though while we. <laughs> I got to go back because I always said that Mance H. Hand could start a uh, musician, a gospel or church gospel musicians, uh, GQ magazine, because, man, I ain't never seen you where you wasn't, as the old folks say, sharp as that just clean, man. I mean, I'm like, who is this guy? You know, I mean, man, I'm telling you. But now these guys want to wear baseball caps. They don't want to wear ties. They want to relax. They want to wear T-shirts and they want to do whatever they want to do. But man, it, I guess it's just in my blood still. Yeah. I, when I go to church, I'm, I'm, I'm going to church. I mean, mm -hmm. I tell them all the time, y'all dress up to go to concerts and to mm -hmm. dinners and buy $100 tickets and yeah. get formal and semi-formal. But then y'all go to church looking like, you know, I, I just don't care. And that's how your dress look, you know. I mean, yeah, well, Bishop, you know what? You're making a very valid point. I, um, 
I'm noticing not just at church, but even in your nice restaurants, uh, you know, nice restaurant and now the concerts, because if you think about it, your art, a lot of your R&B artists, they wear T-shirts, they wear sneakers, you know, where we just go to the concerts and the artists would come out with a suit on or something really, really, you know, sharp and dressed. Um, and I think a part of this with this new generation of musicians, uh, just like in corporate America, as, as, as I move across the country with, with what I do every day, uh, there are no more parents. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, charity styles at home and then spreads abroad. There are no more parents. You know, you know, grandmother now is 38 and she has tattoos on her neck. So, and mother's hanging out with the kids. So, you know, when it trickles down like that, where my mother made me wear a shirt and tie to church. And I can remember vividly, my mom would come home from work on Friday night, on Friday evening, because they had rehearsal on Friday night. She would come home from work on Friday, take her slacks off and put on a skirt to go to choir rehearsal. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and you know, because they just didn't, they didn't wear pants to church, you know, which there's nothing wrong with it now because now as we grew and we read the Bible and we got a better understanding of how that really went, really went. But those days really molded our generation into the look that you need to pre present when you hit the doors of the house of the Lord. So, you know, um, and I'm noticing a lot of guys now they're playing with backpacks on. Oh yeah. Yeah. I man, see, I see guys now they're playing and they got on backpacks and I'm trying to understand what's the purpose of playing the organ with a backpack. on. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I noticed it. I'm noticing, noticing it in different arenas now that, you know, that it's, it's getting more and more lax, more and more lax. And a lot of leaders are afraid to address those issues with the backpacks and coming in smelling like weed because they don't want to lose the musician. They don't lose the musician. So I here again, man, where, where God allowed me to land, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for the structure and to, and to be and to have started this thing as early as I did and to be at the door of 60 now and yeah. can still wake up on Sunday morning and be excited about going to church. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it's such a blessing. But I just hope that you, myself, and, and, and a, a, a forum, a, a consortium of musicians that are seasoned can come together just to be able to share with this new generation of musicians. Because at the end of the day, uh, my statement that, that I made who are you when you get off the instrument? Yeah, man. What kind of person are you once you turn that organ off? Yeah. Once you stop playing the keys, who are you? What, what kind of integrity do you have? What kind of spiritual intellect? Do you talk to God? Do you pray? Yeah. Do yeah. you have do you have do you pray during the week? You know, uh, do you do you ask the Lord to lead you and guide you as you prepare your music for worship? Because everything that's on the radio is not for every church. Thank you. It's just not. You got to know. You got to know your leader. You got to know your congregation, and all of that contributes to how you prepare the music for the worship setting that you're in, and that's so very important. But you know, these guys they top forty, top forty, or whatever, and then. Um, they they do just enough to get them two or three songs ready for a Sunday and they satisfy that that that's what bothers me you know they they really don't have a heart for for that part of ministry as they should because like you say it's a gig to them they know they're going to get get paid and it's sad it is it, is really sad but but you hit on something and we we are going to try to work on a form or something. I had Clark Joseph on last week and, uh, you know, out of, out of Texas mm -hmm. and so many others, I, I, I got to get a hold of uh, Leo Davis down there and I'm going to try to get Fred, Fred Nelson out of mm -hmm. Chicago from first church. Right. I know Fred. Yes. Those guys, man, uh, who are trendsetters and, and, uh, uh, they they just they just been around and have, have saw the seasons change and uh, 
he's pastor now, Eric Thomas out of Chicago. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, so many of those guys that uh, paved the way, and um, and Curtis Daniels. I know you know Curtis out of Ohio. Yeah. Yes, sir. and yes. and the same way with with um, uh, uh, Harrison out of out of Columbus. Columbus, yes. I mean, it's so many of the. Uh, trailblazers. I mean, Wendell Lowe and and so many of these musicians. A friend of mine in in uh, the New York area, Julius Julius Dix, and some of these guys that are still around here. Uh, we talk about it a little bit all the time. And um, but here's the thing that get me. You know, uh, I had that experience where you go to these uh, church services or maybe even a funeral service, home going celebration. And wouldn't you know it, somebody get up and go way back and grab one of them songs because uh, uh, some of this stuff I hear them singing at a funeral, I mean, that that is not for no home going service, you know. <laughs> My hallelujah, that's no, that's not the right song. Right, right. right. <laughs> I mean, we were there, and this was a pastor's. I cite that it was a pastor's home going, and this young lady got up at the end. They getting ready to do the recessional now. Yeah, she starts singing. My, I'm like, and and I was presiding. I was like, okay, who gave that cue? Stop that right away. Right. You know, people people they don't know, and 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 you go to these uh, different times of worship, and the musicians they're just sitting there because they don't have a clue. So that's when they had to call, you know, one of us, <laughs> you know, out the audience and say, can you please help? I've had that happen so many times. So Lord said, I see, I see Woods back there. Would you please come up here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. help me? I mean, I don't mind. I mean, and, and I understand because uh, I, I go to these churches and I hear these musicians, you know, they know the course of a hymn, but if mm -hmm. you say verse, you know, mm -hmm. like I need the, oh, mm -hmm. I need the. Now they can, they can, they can rock with that. Mm -hmm. But you better not start. I need the oh, every hour, oh, prayer. They be like, this is, yeah, no ten devil. Yeah, no like ten nine. Nine. They be like, uh -uh, wait, 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 for, what yeah. is that? <laughs> and listen, and 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 uh, one of my favorite, fairest Lord Jesus, rule of our nation. Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah. Man. <laughs> They they can't even fake it because they don't expose themselves. But 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 listen, talk to me now. You, you, your 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 job. How did you manage to uh, coordinate your schedule and with all of that you had at at Bountiful Blessings and then at church, still working the full time job? You you are uh, because I've, I've seen you. You on the road with FedEx now, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, your position there, and how long you been at FedEx? I've been at FedEx now for forty three years. See, listen, that that's as long as you was with the church. Yeah, absolutely. And and you made it work. Cool. Yeah, I made it work. I made it work. Um, leaders respect you when you stand up and move forward to take care of yourself. Yeah, they have respect for you. Um, I really, as, as as good as Bishop Patterson was to me, and I mean, man, it, you know, it was nothing flaky about it at all. Trust, he was a real father. Um, you know, you know, you're flying on private jets because you know he was the kind of person. Whatever he enjoyed, that's what you enjoy. He didn't stay at the Waldorf, and you stayed at the Red Roof. Wherever he was, <laughs> wherever he was. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why you had to go way down to the Red Roof? Well, I did. I did. You know. I'm, 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 because that's the kind of that's the kind of person he was. Whatever he enjoyed, yes, sir. That's what you enjoyed. You're right. And right. if he went to, um, uh, what what's the store in Detroit? The the men's store in Detroit. Um, cousins back cousins. in the day. If he went to cousins, Jack's place and cousins. Yeah. Jack's place and cousins. I remember Jack's place. If he went to Jack's place or cousins, and he went in there and bought some suits, he would tell you pick you out two or three suits and yeah. i would always be the one to say no i'm good uh -huh. because this is about you right okay right. because let me tell you something some all 
all gifts are not good gifts. Sometimes leaders and and not just in not just in ministry, but even in corporate America, they will say certain things to you to throw it out there to see if you're just gonna take everything that comes your way. If if, if it comes, yeah, I'm gonna take it. Let's go to the high-end restaurant. I'll go. Sometimes you gotta say no. Yeah. And saying no will get you more later on mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. than saying yes to everything all the time. Yeah. Because people want, you know, now one of the most phenomenal musicians is Derek Jackson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Phenomenal. And people were wondering, you know, why is Derek not traveling with Bishop like Mance is? Uh huh. And Derek was just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, he, ugh, he, he, he traveled with Bishop a lot because I did work a lot. You know, I would use, and you would ask me about that. I would use, I had six weeks of vacation. I'd use all of it traveling with Bishop. Mm-hmm. And I worked third shift for over 30 wow. years so that I could be available during the day for funerals. And, you know, if he did things during the day, it was all about ministry with me, man. Whatever he did during the day, I was available for that. Yeah. And so um, you just you just have to give a certain part of yourself to this thing. And so I, I traveled with him and, and, and Derek came on later on and started doing more traveling as my schedule, you know, got more intense because once he became a presiding bishop, he was traveling even more, even more, right, even more. Right. And so my schedule just couldn't keep up with with all of us. So Derek was traveling as well. But I traveled with Bishop for many, many years because I wasn't that guy that was needy. You know, mm-hmm. every time he stopped and he could afford to do whatever. But sometimes you got you got to know how to back up, support your leader, make sure he's okay. And right. then sometimes you would just make, hey man, go get you some soups. Go do this. Go pick you out this. Do that. You know, just let me let me bless you today. And that's fine. But you've got to know how to always support your leader. Now, of course, you know, you all, you know, Bishop Pastor could buy whatever you want to. But I was so seasoned to his life. Yes, sir. I would give him an offering. I'd buy him a pair of shoes. I'd buy him neckties. I'd buy him shirts. Not that he couldn't afford to buy it. But it was just my way of saying, hey, man, thank you for allowing me to be a part of what, you, what you're what you a part of. Because guess what? If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't yes. be getting the kind of exposure that I'm getting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hear People you. wouldn't be hearing me play all over America if it wasn't for you. Man, right? when I start talking like that, they they be like, man, we don't want to hear that. I said, but y'all got to hear so you can learn something yeah. because, you know, I am only where I am because of those that paved the way for me. And I would tell it, I, I still tell that story today, man. People talk about St. James. And then of course I take them all the way back to uh to the Craigs with the voices of Tabernacle and Tommy and them. Yes. You know, yeah, God is smiling on me album. But yes, you know, it, it was actually Charles Nix that asked my grandfather, man, uh, let me take him with me and that's how I got all over the country, man. You know, like you said, traveling and being exposed and creating relationships. And I, I tell this testimony, and I know you can you can bear witness with your own life and how you did with Bishop. I am still living on residual blessing mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. when I was connected with St. James and Charles Me. Yes. Today. Absolutely. And you know what? I, to your point, let me let me just tell you this. Even I'm a recruiter for FedEx. And so uh, when I started recruiting, I realized that as large as the company is, no one was actually bringing people in from the largest entity around. It's the church. So when yeah. I came on board, I knew preachers in every city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. And I'll just call these bishops and call preachers. And uh, and then Dr. Norman, where I am now, he knows preachers all over the country. Yes. Sir. So having those connections and being able to make that phone call. And so my, my vice presidents and presidents of FedEx said, "Who is? How's he doing this? We haven't been able to open these markets up." Man, I go in these churches, and in one night I go in on, on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night and sign up ninety people, a hundred people, eighty people, ninety people. Just because, of, and I would call, I, I'd say either Dr. Keith Norman or I'd say Bishop Patterson. Bam. 
come on, Doc, let's do it. Yeah. Let's get it done. And you know, Indianapolis is is big apostolic town. Yes, sir. And Bishop um Gold. I'm to think of the, Bishop um I can't even think of his name right now. Uh, God, he preached for us. Um, I called him. He's a he's a presiding bishop now, I think, in Apostolic, in, in the Oh, Apostolic. yeah, I think I, I know you're talking about. I forgot that his name. Yeah. I'm having a senior moment. Um, I know those golden. It'll, those it'll, yeah, it'll come, he has a huge church in Indianapolis. And he allowed me to come there one night, man. Maybe 100 people came for the FedEx experience. And so having those kind of relationships, uh, with men of stature like that, you know, it, it helps you as you move on in your life, you know, with other things. And then, of course, when you have had integrity in your life and you haven't been, I just got to be real, got to be clear. You know, you don't have children all over the country. You yeah. don't have a reputation for running up people's phone bills. You don't have a reputation for writing bad checks to folks. <laughs> when you have yeah. all <laughs> of that. that kind of thing. Uh, Lambert Gates. In, in yes, Indianapolis, yeah, Lambert. Bishop Lambert Gates. That's who brought me in to Indianapolis. And so, when you have a clean slate, that people can trust you coming into their ministry with their people, that's big. And and yes, integrity, sir. integrity is everything, you know. So, and I, and I tell these young guys now that as they come up in ministry with music, man, keep your integrity clear. You can't sleep with the choir members. You can't. You can't you know, go out and, and, and have all of these parties and things like that and think that the people that you serve are going to respect you. Yeah. You just they can't do have... it. So sometimes people think, well, you know, he cocky, he acts funny, he don't do this. But a lot of that is to protect you and to protect me. Yes, sir. I would much rather you say that I'm standoffish or cocky or whatever, and you respect me and respect my ministry and have confidence in me when I began to minister, then to hang out with you, party with you, you know, do all these things with you. And then when I get ready to minister on Sunday, you have no respect for me. Man, that, that that's awesome. That's very important. You, yeah, you already you already talking the stuff I want you to talk to these young guys and young ladies, yeah. because there, there, there is that problem of, of uh, a lot of pastors, first thing they tell me, don't send me one of these whippersnappers that's going to come and run through my choir with these girls and all. I said, man, I don't, I don't control people. I said, uh, <laughs> right. And, and that's why I kind of stopped because, uh, you know, I'm like, all I got is my name. And, I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I sent you over here to a church. You, you getting in a good situation, going over there, messing up with craziness, man. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's just happening everywhere. But but listen, talk to us uh, uh, about about that that spiritual stability that uh, is missing uh, as we as we get past this this pandemic situation, and we're kind of getting back to in person because I'm looking, I'm I'm seeing choir fest, I'm seeing mm -hmm. folk bringing the choirs to certain some of them are touring, you know. I know uh, Ricky. Dylan and New G and then yeah. Kevin Lemons and I call and Hezekiah, they do it. They just did Choir Fest and then uh, Church God Christ just come out of the AIM convention and right. people are coming back and we're getting back to see that. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy. I'm just <laughs> elated, man. But, but I still think that uh, somebody like yourself with integrity and the track record can say something uh, to this generation concerning their their character and their integrity and uh, their their preparation for ministry. Yes. Well, when you talk about preparation, two P's are involved. In order to prepare, you first got to pray. You got to pray and ask God to give you an open mind, an open heart, an open spirit for what you're about to do. You got to ask God to clean your heart, clean your mind, clean your spirit. And God, give me what to say. Give me what to say to your people. Give me what, give me the right songs. Give me the right hymn. Give me the right song for altar call. Give me the right song for the time of giving. And that giving is a very important part of the worship. 
give me the right song for benediction because as the people leave, that's the last thing that hits their spirit is the music that they hear when they're leaving out the door. So you got to ask God not only to prepare you, but you got to pray and ask for these things. And if you pray, he'll give it to you. So that means that you got to have a, a prayer life in this, in this idiom of, of gospel music. You got to have a prayer life. You got to spend some time with the Lord. You got to spend some time listening and hearing him because if you listen to him, he'll give it to you. And here's another piece. You also, if you sit in the service and you feel how the service is going and what the pastor's saying, the God will give you the song. He'll give you the right song for the altar call. He'll give you the right song for the benediction. And as, the, as they go into the time of worship, he'll give it to you. But your spiritual intellect has to kick in. There has to be a foundation where you just don't pray on Sunday on your way to church, you know, or right before you drive up to the church before your rehearsal session. You got to have, because you are the leader, of God's people in the music ministry, you've got to have that time of preparation and prayer with God so that when you walk into his people, you are ready to give them what they need so that they can prepare the people for the word of God uh, musically. So, you know, it's, it's, it's spiritual intelligence because now everybody now is into um, electronics, they're into, you know, the quick way of doing it, but there has to be spiritual intelligence that tells you at some point, turn off the machines, turn off all of the, the automatic uh, pieces of, of what you're doing and let's just go raw with God. Let him bless us. Let's just, let's give God our gifts from our heart and then let him flow, let the spirit of God flow into your gift to where it flows into the people of God. Because as you're preparing, the, and I'm not saying, Put on a show before the man of God gets up. No, 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 don't do that. Don't don't shout the people tired. Don't have them tired. But put the set the atmosphere so spiritually that when he gets up, preaching is easy because that music has prepared and set the atmosphere for everything else that's about to happen. And you just never know. Sometimes the right song will touch that person that was about to commit suicide. Sometimes the right song will touch that person that's got to go to the doctor the next day and don't know what's going to happen. You know, they'll go with another spirit, they'll go with another man. You know, uh, um, um, be not dismayed, whatever be tired, God will take care of you. Things like that. You know, some people don't, don't know where to turn. They don't know who, you know, who to turn to. And then you, you play a song like that, Wow, beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. In every day, you know, throughout the way, he will take care of you. Songs like that where people can say, you know what? Oh, I got a breath of fresh air mm. because that's exactly what I need at this point. And then when the word comes, the word puts a stamp of approval on everything that's happened. So as, as music, music leaders, we have most definitely got to make sure that our time of preparation, our time of spirituality is in place. And I go back to my point again. There's a certain sacrifice that we have to make in order to have that spirituality within our hearts, which means that there are certain things that we got to give up, certain things that we can't do, certain places we can't go, certain people we can't associate with. Because if you really want to get it, really, really want to get it good, and the, the Bible says, be separated, come, out, come from among them and be separated. So you're going to have to separate yourself to a great degree and cling more to the word of God and get more in tune to the leader spiritually to see where he's going, where God is taking him. And trust me, that's an awesome team. When the minister and the musician come together, that's an awesome team of ministry. Can't beat it, man. That can't beat it. You can't words beat it. of wisdom right here from the one and only Maestro himself. Mass HN man, I'm telling you, uh, if, if these guys can just latch latch on and lock in, uh, things would be a lot lot different. Uh, even even with some of the community choirs that I've witnessed, I know here out of Detroit, you know, uh, I'm I'm saying to these guys, you all sang too good. Stop all of the choreography and 
all of the dramatizations and whatever happened to this flat foot singer. Flat foot singer, yeah. You know, that's what I call it. I, I told one choir, I went to a program, uh, I'll never forget, just before the pandemic hit, man, I could not hear them for looking at them. <laughs> they look, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I, I hear the sound, but when I open my eyes, oh my God, it just totally distracts me. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what it is that, that uh, and I'm gonna ask you this last question. Uh, have we allowed, even in our music and in some cases the churches, have we allowed the, the world uh, to kind of influence us, I mean, with fashion and style and behavior as opposed to the church influencing the world. Yeah, I believe that I believe that to a great degree because if you think about it, um, a lot of your recording artists are bringing R and B singers to sing yeah. on their records. Um, and you have a lot of gospel recording artists now that are not, let me just put this in a good way, I'm trying to find a good way to say this. They are compromising their standards to a great degree. You see them at the premiere parties. Yeah. You see them, uh, you know, they don't look like they're going to church. You see them dressing a certain way. Where uh -huh. they're, they are, they're, and, and here's the thing, a lot of, instead of, instead of now being gospel singers, they are becoming gospel celebrities. Yeah. Okay. And there's a big difference in being a gospel singer and a gospel celebrity. Because yeah, I, I had somebody to correct me, man. I was saying, oh man, y'all stop saying that. This ain't no woods. Yeah. You, you yeah. come on. They, so let me tell you some something. of these folk want to be rock stars and yeah, like you said, celebrities. And and when I saw that last concert with the guy with they had, they had the lights and the smoke yeah. machines and i'm like oh this yeah. is a rock concert you know it's it's a performance i mean they had an arena so people going to arena to to outright look at and hear a performance it's it's not worship but they're supposedly singing the lord's song this guy did a special on gospel music uh, excuse me in in his video he said i'm gonna turn off the music and you tell me what this looked like. And honestly, he had a point. Uh, if you didn't know what they were singing or saying, you would swear that was a rock concert. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> there was no, he turned the sound off so you can just see, you know, uh, uh, the actual picture. And uh, so I'm just wondering, man, you know, a lot of churches are getting the LED giant screens and, uh, Mm -hmm. They turning the lights down and the spotlights on, and uh, uh, I tell my musicians that work with me all through the years, I'm not gonna pay you, you know, and then you dress like you want to dress. And the choir uh, are tied paying members, offering giving their body on robes and all stuff, and mm -hmm. you get paid to play. I said even McDonald's got uniforms. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You yeah. know. And and they better wear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you're, right. you're absolutely right. Burger King, well, all of them, White Castles. Yeah, yeah. they got uniforms. Yeah. So you're gonna uniform. come to church getting paid, you know, a salary, mm -hmm. you know, big money, and and don't have enough money to buy a nice dress shirt and a pair of slacks. I mean, even if you don't wear a suit, come come right. to decent, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what, Bishop? We we I am so happy and excited because I'm I'm seeing it a lot more now. A lot of churches have taken the choir stand away. Oh yeah, they don't for, oh, for the big screen. Now at First Baptist, we still have a full choir stand. We still have a full choir law, and it's it's something about that look. When you walk in church and you just see that 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 long line of people that are standing there getting ready to praise God in song. It's just something about the look. And so what we've done at First Baptist. Of course, during the pandemic, we made adjustments, you know, to a smaller group of singers. Yeah. Um, we made adjustments to a smaller group of people who, as we started to come back into the church, and uh, as we, you know, 
began to open the doors again and people started coming back into the church. Uh, what we're doing now, we're singing larger groups now, uh, you know, with the, the men's choir and uh, the sanctuary choir, we're singing, but we're still practicing uh, social distancing because this thing is not all the way over yet. Right. But just to see if you got, because we probably got about 100 to 150 choir members, but to see 25 or 30 or 40 choir members that are just overly excited just to be back. It just yeah. makes your heart, it makes your heart full of joy because they've just been at home singing. They've been singing on Zoom. They've been singing on YouTube, right? <laughs> they've been singing online. And so when they get to come back to church and stand in a choir loft, man, whether it's black skirts and white blouses or is where, whether it's the, the robe, whatever it is, it's just that it's just that feeling that they get being in the yeah. presence of the Lord and being able to sing that kind of thing. So I'm just, I'm happy for the point of, of where I am that we did not make that we didn't we didn't compromise and and uh you know take the choir stand out because this thing is not gonna last forever god's gonna turn it around and the choir yeah. is gonna come back strong yeah i believe yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it I'm yeah, they're gonna come back strong. yes sir yeah they're gonna come back strong and we're gonna be there to see it we're gonna be there to enjoy it man yeah but yeah. I, I have you, you just don't know what um this time of sharing with an icon such as yourself you know, I man, um, I'm humbled. I'm humbled, man. I I I I played, um, and I didn't know that the 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 the, the workshop board meeting was in Memphis. And so one Sunday morning, I'm sitting there doing off, and I start playing. I really love the Lord. I really love the Lord. Not <laughs> knowing that JD was in the audience. What? <laughs> he was here for the meeting. He was in Memphis yeah. for the meeting. And so somebody was pointing and said. He over there, he over there. And I looked over there and he was waving. Man, I almost passed out. Because <laughs> <laughs> JD wrote, I really have, I really love the Lord. Right? Yes, sir. And, 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 and what people don't know, Bishop, I don't even know if you know this. Before we came back into the Church of God in Christ, during the convocation, we would always have a musical on official Sunday at three o'clock at Battle of the Blessings. Uh -huh. We were Battle of the Blessings, not Church of God in Christ. And so all of the artists, everybody would just come to Memphis just to support Dr. Clark. They would just show up. They would just show up. No money, just show up. So on a Sunday evening, I'll never forget it. It was Rudolph Stanfield, Keith Pringle, Mr. Clean, Hubert Powell, um, um, Ruben Lightfoot. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, man. Um, it is just a, a host of musicians that showed up at Bountiful that Sunday evening. And Rudolph Stanfield presented a song that Keith Pringle sang. Yeah. And it was the first time this song had ever been presented. And now it's almost like, oh, happy day. Yes, sir. And you know, and you know what the name of that song was? What was it? Perfect Peace. Perfect Peace. Yes, sir. That was the first time we heard it. And Keith Pringle sang that song at Bountiful Blessing. It was born at Bountiful Blessing. And man, you know, I, I was able to bring James Cleveland and his group. I brought the whole Walter Hawkins family. Uh, of course, the O'Neill twins. We had Jesse, oh, man. we had Cassetta George. The one of my dreams was to bring the Craig brothers. Yeah, and I'm so glad Bishop allowed me to bring them because they both have passed away now. We brought the Craig brothers one Thanksgiving. And I'll just uh, and they did just knowing Jesus, I almost had to go out. <laughs> <laughs> Out. Listen, I'm telling you, man, for, for years, yes. when they did that song, I don't care what else, even, even the Detroit chapter, when yeah. especially when Bishop was the chapter rep and, and we would be ready to leave the stage, they wouldn't let us leave. And, and James would say, well, you got to give the people what they want. You got to give them what they want. They had to do at least one round. Yes, yes, sir. Just going, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> oh man, 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 you, you bringing back memories, dog. I'm telling yes, you, sir. yes, that, sir. That 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 workshop, man. I, I, I we miss it, man. We, you yeah. know, uh, they was calling me, saying, "You going to Atlanta?" I said, "No." You know, uh, a couple of times I went, and it was okay, but I was like, um. I miss the people, man. The, the, yes. the so many 
of those those pioneers and and uh, the originals, as I call them, the the pillars of the workshop. So many of the chapter reps and people gone, man, and it's not the same, you know, because they they invested so much every year into that, you know, and, and those of us like myself, who I call myself a workshop baby, you know, cause yes. you know, the workshop afforded me uh, a lot of my privilege. Of course, Rep. C. Reverend Charles Nix was over the chapter reps. And so if Donald couldn't go, he couldn't go, or Charles Foe couldn't go, they would, he would send me or Quincy Fielding or Jeffrey LaValle or somebody uh, yes. in the country, man, yes. to do the workshop. That's how I started traveling, doing yes. workshops on my own. Of course, uh, Chris Ware, who was uh, my, my Sunday night musician, who I broadcast at my grandfather's church, was chapter rep then, and Kenny Troy and all. Man, I'm telling you, uh, those those days, uh, I'm so happy that, that that we're at that age where we can reflect on then and still see transition now and still be a part of what God is doing now in music. But uh, we, we're getting ready, man, because I already told Rudy, uh, as soon as this thing give a little bit more, we got to bring some kind of mass choir back together and uh, just do some, just sing. Yep. Get our memory lane, and then then we'll come back again and do new stuff. But uh, I just want to hit them good old Jubilee choir songs. <laughs> That's right. If if you ever need it, oh man, if you need it. <laughs> Work and on listen, let me tell you this, Bishop. Let me tell you this. You know, you don't do a lot of movement when you when you're playing the organ. But I'm gonna tell you something, sir. You got a left hand on that bass line that's just absolutely dangerous. It's that. That left hand that you do on that bass line is just ridiculous. <laughs> oh man, thank you, Chuck. It's ridiculous. And I'm, and I'm telling you, you know, um, over the years, just watching that and, and going back and playing those records over and over again and over and over again and and, and adopting that style of of organ genius, it's just been a privilege, man, you know, watching you from afar for so many years and admiring, uh, even when you had your group and the choir. Uh, that you had and the, the record that you guys put out, I would just sit back and listen to that music. And it was something about those that that kind of music that just radiated you, man, and 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 made you want to get out there and just and and learn that stuff and get it. And so I want to appreciate the gift that God has put in you and uh, you. all of the Thank years you. that you have been in this thing and you still at it, you still good at what you do. That means that your integrity has stood tall. And to have a brother like myself to stand back. Although I had a good situation for those years, but to have a mentor such as yourself, someone to look up to and say, you know what, I want to still be able to do it just like Bishop Andre was. And uh, so, man, hey, my hat's off to you, too, for being the, the, the pioneer that you are. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. I, I keep telling Rudy, as we all just I'm, I'm still a work in progress. Thank God that we're still around and God ain't through with us yet. Yes, There's sir. still some more. Uh, that God want us to do to leave legacy, you know, and part of my effort just doing this, you know, uh, when I was sitting around, God gave me this program and I do another one uh, called This Is My Story. And uh, it's for the purpose, because without the Grammy, without the Stella, without the award and all this, there's so many musicians who are iconic where they are. People mm -hmm. just don't know their name. They never heard their story, the songs that they've written and the uh, arrangements and and uh, whatever state they hail from, whatever church, whatever city. Uh, and, and I'm saying that because when I was traveling, I mean, consistently, I would walk into some churches, man, and be blown away, you know, to hear the mm -hmm. caliber of talent uh, that I heard in musicianship and singers. And I'm like, yeah. my God, nobody, nobody would have never known. I mean, places like Anderson, Indiana, and Terre Haute. See, I went to all them little cities around the big cities. Yeah. You know, and and it's amazing, man, uh, how far reaching. And I'm gonna tell you this about you. You you really don't know uh to the extent of how far 
your music ministry have reached uh, when we go in circles and we go to talk about church and ministries and we start name dropping and then we say, man, you, you done met them, you heard them, yeah. Well, we watch them on TV. We, it's yeah. it's such a blessing, man. Wow. And, and thank God for your your stellar integrity and everything you said tonight. Uh, I, I thank you for it because you have certainly exhibited that uh, in your lifestyle and in your music ministry. And man, uh, the pastor already know where you are, that they are blessed to have you on board. Uh, to share with them and give what God has given you. So we appreciate this time. Thank and you, Bishop. We got to do this again, man, because this yes. time ain't long enough. We, I told I told some other brother, we need to get our own network and just talk all day, 24 <laughs> Just talk Anytime, about, Bishop. about music. Well, listen, man, uh, 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 thank you and thank all of thank you, you who joined uh, us in the comment section. If you missed any part of this, listen, it'll, 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 it'll play again on our pages. And then certainly uh, uh, go to our YouTube channel and uh, subscribe to the Fellowship of Music and Arts. Become a member. Don't cost you nothing. Just, just say you want to come on. We'll let you in, you know, uh, to be a part. We're building an army of praisers and we're thanking God. We're networking the kingdom. That's what we're doing. Yes. And thank God for this opportunity. Listen, man, I want to pray for you before yes. we go, and then uh, we'll be gone for this time. Father, we thank you for this awesome privilege of fellowship, and I thank you, God, for my brother and how you've blessed him and kept him, how you've made him a living example. He's a living epistle and a testimony to the wondrous work that you do in humanity. We thank you for his ministry, God. We thank you for his very life. Now we ask God to, for you to continue to bless him. And we pray the prayer, Psalms 90 and 17, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon him and establish the work of thy hands upon him. Yea, the work of thy hands establish thou it. So God, whatever his hands touch, mm. we thank you that you will cause it to prosper in Jesus' name. If there's a need in his life right now, we pray that you supply all of his need, God, according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we pray, God, that you will continue to anoint him afresh for the assignment that you've given his life and that he shall continue to walk worthy before you. So we thank you, God, and we ask your blessings on him spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, and financially. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And thank God. Thank God. Bless all of you tonight. And listen, we'll be back next week. Uh, and we want you to join us. I have Linnell Andrews on, one of the plainest women in the country. Yes. Going to be yes. our guest next week. And we invite you to share with us. Again, subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Fellowship of Music and Arts. Until next week. Listen, man, take care of yourself. Thank and you, Bishop. We'll be in touch real soon. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And bless you, Bishop. Love you with my heart. Take care. Bless you. All right.